Well, I want to talk to you today about living with God in faith. You know, our society teaches us just uh, so many options. Uh, it seems that things just aren't as clear in, uh, in anything in our culture today as they were when I was younger. And perhaps you think even farther beyond that one. Uh, there were some pretty clear ideas that we all shared about what was right and what was wrong. Today, it's, it's hard to even have a conversation about what's right and what's wrong. And yet, uh, Jesus taught us, uh, basically, that we had a, a couple of options. Uh, we're either for him or we're against him. You know, one of the things that I enjoy about much of the Bible is that it's, there's many, many places where it's absolutely crystal clear. One of those places, and we look at John's letters, John talks about light and dark. And the Bible teaches us that we're either lost or saved. It says in the judgment, he'll separate the sheep from the goats to the left and the right. Not all these variations in between, but to the left and to the right. Those that enter in and those that say, depart from me, I never knew you. So when you think about living life, we really have a couple options. We can live with God or we can live against God. In the passage that we're looking at today, this is uh, Stephen as he was standing before the Sanhedrin and he was giving a an account of his faith. And you know, as we think about Stephen and what he was facing, I remember growing up and uh, thinking about how different America was from the rest of the world. We watch the news and we see uh, people being burned alive. We see acts of terror. We see uh, war and battles being fought in, in people's front yards and in the middle of their town and, and thinking... We don't see anything like this in America. America is such a different place. And then hearing about persecution and thinking of persecution in places like Africa and then later uh, in the Middle East and Iran and these different things and thinking, but, but we don't have persecution uh, in, in America. And yet I think that we're seeing so many shifts in our world that we may someday be experiencing some of the things, same things in America that other believers have faced for years and years around the world. And so you and I might be uh, tempted to look at the life of a man named Stephen who uh, suffered persecution for his faith and think, well, I'll, you know, that's, that doesn't really apply to me. I don't plan on being a missionary, so I'll probably never be in a situation like that. And yet the reality is, is that we, we may very well come to the point that we have to give a defense for our faith. And Stephen, as he stood before the Sanhedrin, he no doubt knew how this trial was going to, to end. The jury was completely stacked against him. The Sanhedrin had trumped up false witnesses to bring charges before him. Their very purpose was to get rid of him and to shut him up. And yet, as he stood before them, he didn't beg for mercy, he didn't recant. Instead, in great boldness, uh, he told them the story of a man named Joseph, who though his brothers were all against him, God was with him and delivered him in the end. And you know, when God's with you, uh, that's really all that matters, isn't it? If you know who God is, that's really all that matters. And so Stephen was able to stand there knowing that he was just really probably moments away from his death. And yet he stood there in amazing courage and boldness because he had faith that God was with him. I don't think there's anybody here today that's facing persecution unto death. But there's probably some people here today that have other kinds of problems. There may be some people here today that are truly struggling in marriage and relationships. There may be people here today that are struggling with financial hardships that, that even their closest friends don't really know about. There may be some here today that are struggling with disease, mourning the loss of loved ones perhaps. There's a million things that we do go through. And yet the passage that we're looking at today the promise of God is as true for your situation as it was for Stephen that God is with us when we believe and trust in him. 
And though he doesn't spare us from everything in life, he will go with us through it. So I want to invite you to turn with me today to Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 9 as we look at this passage as Stephen tells the story of this man named Joseph from the Old Testament. And would you stand with me just out of honor and reverence for God's Word as we read this together? Acts chapter 9, uh, chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. This is what the Bible says. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into slavery. But God, listen to this, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, a great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that just as Stephen was encouraged and strengthened by the faith of Joseph, Father, I pray that we too today, we would look at how you worked in his life, how you delivered him, how you provided for him. And Father, it would cause us to trust you and depend upon you and, Lord, I pray for every person that's here today that's struggling, whatever it might be that they're dealing with. Father, I pray that your guiding presence and provision would encourage them and get them through. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, one of the things that we learn from this passage as Stephen looks back at the life of Joseph is that if we trust God... He will be with us. If we trust God, He will be with us. And we mean more than just physically present. When I say with us, I mean He is on our side with us. And so the Bible says in this verse that we just read, it says, and the patriarchs, those were the, the brothers of Joseph. God had uh, raised up a man, and he promised that he was going to turn him into a great nation. And now a couple generations later, there are 12 sons. And of these 12, God is going to use in an amazing way to rescue the family. But his brothers, the other 11 brothers, uh, they don't have any appreciation for how God is going to use Joseph. They're jealous, and they're envious of him. And so the Bible describes these men, though. It says, and the, the patriarchs. And it says their motive, jealous of Joseph, sold him into slavery. But listen to this. Here's the key to this. But God was with him. If you think about Joseph, Joseph had a difficult life. The Bible tells us the story of Joseph. Joseph was a, a young man that his father absolutely loved. And he took great pride in him. And God revealed to Joseph the dream that he was going to use him to rescue his brothers. But his, his brothers, they were, they were jealous and they were envious of him. The Bible tells a story about his father that made Joseph this coat of many colors. And when his brothers saw it, they, 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 they mocked him and they, they were jealous because they knew that their father loved Joseph. And so they, some of them wanted to kill him. But some of the other brothers decided, no, let's, let's put him down in a well. And then they saw this group of people traveling by headed to Egypt. And they said, well, why should we just kill him and not get anything out of him? Let's just sell him. And so they sold him into slavery. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of lessons to this. One of them is that maybe being an only child is not so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other is, is that just because you're following God does not mean you'll live a problem-free life. 
Think about this. This man's own brothers wanted to kill him, and they, they bound him, and they sold him into slavery. Well, Joseph goes on from there. He's taken down to Egypt. He's sold to a man named Potiphar. And this man, Potiphar, uh, he notices that Joseph's a great worker. And Joseph's not only a great worker, he's, he's wise. Everything Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of, it just it goes well. And so he keeps putting him in charge of more things until finally Potiphar, this very wealthy and powerful man, he puts Joseph over his entire household estate. And Potiphar's thinking, I, I, this is great. All I got to worry about is serving Pharaoh. I don't even worry about my, my estate and my farm and my household business. Uh, Joseph's got it all taken care of. Until one day Potiphar's wife, who had noticed for a long time that Joseph was uh, quite attractive, she keeps uh, making advances on him, and he refuses. And one day, uh, he finds himself alone in the house with her. And she begs him to, to lay with her. And when she does, he runs out of the house. And as he runs out of the house, she gets a piece of his clothing. And later, when Potiphar comes home, she says, Look what this slave has done to me. He's trying to humiliate our whole family. And Potiphar throws Joseph into prison. I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced this where you feel like every time you get one foot ahead, you get knocked back. This is, this is where Joseph is in his life. And Joseph's in prison. And we don't really know how long, but it seems to be for quite a while. He's in prison, and Pharaoh uh, decides to throw a couple of his chief officials into prison. And they both have dreams, and they begin to tell Joseph about their dreams. And Joseph interprets their dreams for them, and he inter interprets them accurately. And he says, when these things happen, uh, don't forget about me. And Pharaoh calls these two servants back out of prison and one is executed, like Joseph predicted, and the other is exalted. And yet he quickly forgets about Joseph. And so once again, Joseph's forgotten about and left in, in prison. Now, I don't know really what your problems are or, you know, how they relate to being sold into slavery, falsely accused of adultery, imprisoned, and then forgot about and left in a dungeon to die. But that's where Joseph was. He, he had a difficult life. And, you know, I found that in life, how we respond to crisis, it, it reveals who we are. Our character comes out under pressure. When things are going smoothly, it's easy to invent whatever kind of person that you want to pretend to be. But when we come in under pressure, the real person actually comes out. You know what I'm talking about? And Joseph's under, under tremendous amount of pressure. I was watching a, a television yesterday. There was this uh, little, little game on. And, uh, uh, well, we won't mention the score. It's not worth mentioning. But Alabama played Tennessee. And anyway, yeah, they were talking about this uh, freshman quarterback that Alabama has. And his first game... His very first play, he fumbled the football. Now, I don't, I don't really know uh, what that would be like to be in front of 100,000 live fans with uh, Nick Saban, the, probably the, the best uh, coach in college football, standing on the sideline, and millions of people watching on TV to see what you're going to do because you're the number one you know, recruit, and then your first play of the game, you fumble the football. And they said that he picked the ball up, executed the next play, just flawlessly and completely unrattled. And uh, Coach Saban said that he thought far more of him after having fumbled the ball and recovered so well than he did before that play. And I hate it for Alabama because, you know, they don't have any good players. I guess they got one now, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> so how you respond, it reveals... What's going on inside of you? 
Most of us, if we had been in Joseph's shoes, uh, to be honest, how many of us would just had an outright panic attack? Maybe a crisis of faith. How many people would have cried out and said, said, there is no God. How could God leave me in this place? How many of us would have sat there in the dungeon and said, I don't understand, God, what I did. What, what did I do wrong to, to, to deserve this? And yet, if, if Joseph ever had a crisis of faith, it wasn't recorded in Scripture. There he was. He was sold into slavery, falsely accused, imprisoned, and forgotten about. And, and yet, the Bible says, but God was with him. You see, Joseph had a difficult life, but God led him through it. And you see, what we see is we see a man, Joseph, under great pressure, and yet under pressure he still trusted and believed in God. So, so the question is not really what's your faith like this morning because it, isn't it easy to have faith on Sunday morning? We're surrounded by believers. We sing about faith. It's what's expected. We, we say something about our testimony, and everybody claps and says, that's right. I mean, we, they cheer us on. It's so easy. But, but the question is, is that, that later in the week when we find ourselves surrounded by unbelievers and things are not going our way at all in so many areas of life, it, it's at those moments that our true faith is, is revealed. And Joseph we find believes that God is with him. And God was not just physically present with Joseph in spirit, but he was actively working on his behalf. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 39. This is a description of the Lord working with Joseph. This is what it says. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Oh, isn't that something? The Bible says that the reason that Joseph was so successful was because God was with him, and God was with him in such a remarkable way that even, even Potiphar recognized that it was the Lord working through him. You say, well, that, that's... That's an amazing Bible story. It is an amazing Bible story, but I'm, I believe that it's meant for all of us to live. You see, I believe that if we were to trust God with all of our heart and try to follow Him, that He would be with us in such a way that even lost people would look at us and say there's something completely different about that person. I was, uh, I was watching an, an interview not too long ago, and I don't know if you all remember Phil Donahue from years ago. And uh, he was, uh, I, can't, I can't remember which network he was with. And Phil Donahue was uh, covering this mine accident. These miners had been uh, trapped underground. And uh, Phil Donahue had been sent there to film. And it was in the middle of winter. It was, it was freezing cold. And uh, during that moment, they, they finally got the miners out. And there was a local pastor that had came there. And all the families were kind of gathered up. And uh, he said, let, let, let's, let's all pray together. And, and Phil looked at the crew and he said, he said that, that, we got to get this on film. And they went to fire up the cameras and they wouldn't come on because it was too cold. And so it took them about uh, a couple minutes, he said, to get those things warmed up and to get the electronics working until they could get them on a film. And, and they, they missed the prayer. And so, so Phil Donahue went over to the, to the pastor and he said, uh, he said Pastor, he said, we, we, we missed it. We, we, we couldn't get the cameras running. He said, can you... Uh, uh, can you gather everybody back up and, 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 and pray again? And he said, the pastor said, no, I, I, I can't do it. And Phil Donahue said, N -n 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 you don't understand. There, there's 15 national networks that want to see this. And he said, I, if you'll just gather everybody up and, and, and pray again, he said, uh, we're going we're gonna to film it. We're going to broadcast it live to the world. And he said, the, the preacher said, sir, I've, I've already prayed. It would be wrong to pray again like that. And Phil Donahue said he got back on the phone with New York, and he said, uh, the preacher won't pray. <laughs> and he said he couldn't persuade him. And he said, I left there thinking that day, 
He said, here's a man that even when given the opportunity before millions of people refused to showboat. And he said, I left there thinking, if anybody's going to heaven, it's that man. See, his sincerity and faith, it greatly spoke to him. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, and even Potiphar knew that it was the Lord working through Joseph. And I believe today that if we were to live our life following God, that even lost people would say, God is with them. And so Joseph, he had God on his side. The Bible says about uh, when Joseph was in prison, Genesis 39, 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And then verse 23, it says, The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Listen to this. Because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Listen, when... When God is with you, everything changes. Romans 8, 31, the second part of that verse, listen to what it says. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I, I don't know if you realize that, that in our society, we're becoming progressively more and more of a minority. Madisonville is really not a microcosm of America. We're, we're more the exception. In this place, there's probably more people that are either uh, Christians or sympathetic to Christianity than we find in other places in America. And there's many places that you could go just a few hours from here and to even talk about your faith, you'd be ostracized and viewed as strange. And if you go on the university campus, you'll find uh, all kinds of people speaking out against our faith. In uh, the world, we're becoming more and more of a minority. But friend, you shouldn't be discouraged by that because the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? See, the great comfort of the Bible is the fact that God is with us. God never says that you'll outnumber all the enemy. But friend... God plus one is a majority. And when God is with us, it, it doesn't matter if the entire world is against us. The Bible said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so the Bible says that God was with Joseph. This is what David said about death. David, a man that lived in fear much of his life and ran hiding in caves from uh, his own family, from Saul and others in the 23rd Psalm, this is what he said. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's why. For you are with me. And when we think about what God is calling us to do, whether it's your own individual ministry, your witness out in the world, or collectively as a church, we don't have anything to be afraid of or to be intimidated about because God is with us. And no matter what you're going through personally in your life, you can depend upon God. If you believe and trust in Him, He is with you. You know what the Bible says here in Acts chapter 7, verse 13, as Stephen is retelling the story of Joseph. This is what he says. He says, and on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Notice what he said. He said it was on the second visit. And that's what happened. You go back and read the book of Genesis. Joseph's brothers came. They, they didn't know who this man in charge of Egypt was. They went back. They came back again. And on the second visit's when they understood who Joseph was. Friend, the Jews, many of them, they didn't understand the first time that Jesus came that he was the Messiah, but they'll understand the second time on the second visit. But the blessing is those who understand on the first visit who he is. And even when we can't see it, God is taking care of his children. Look at verse 10. It says, and rescued him out of all his afflictions. Rescued him out of all his afflictions.
afflictions. You say, well, how did he rescue him? Friend, Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him. And instead, God gave him the idea just to sell him into slavery instead. They sold him to a man named Potiphar. And God blessed him and everything he did. He, he rose up. To, he, was, he was running Potiphar's entire household. And then Potiphar's wife falsely accused him. And so he put him in prison. And then God gave him favor with the, the man who was in charge of the prison so that he began to put Joseph in charge of different things. And then he, didn't, he said that he didn't worry about anything that Joseph did because he knew that God was with him. And, and then later, God would elevate Joseph the second in command of all of Egypt. This Pharaoh had a dream, and one of his servants said, said, I met a man in prison that can interpret dreams. And Pharaoh said, go get him. And Joseph encountered Pharaoh himself. And after accurately interpreting his dream and then leading Egypt to prepare for a famine, Pharaoh put him in charge of all of Egypt. You see, God brought Joseph from absolute total obscurity to running a world empire. Now, I don't know that God has political ambitions for any of us, but I want you to know this, that no matter what our circumstances are all around us, whenever we depend upon God, He will take care of us and He will lead us and guide us through. Even when we can't see it, God is taking care of His children Joseph suffered at the hands of men, but he was rescued by the hand of God. And later at the end of his life, as Joseph's brothers began to know who he was, and they came to live in Egypt, and their father was at the point of death, they worried that Joseph would retaliate against them. And this is what Joseph said in Genesis 50, verse 20. This is what he said to his brothers. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today oh joseph he could have looked at his whole situation through human eyes and he he could have said you know now that my father's dead there's nothing to save you guys it's uh, it's going to be bad for you why don't, why don't we start out with a little slavery i know a guy i put you to work at his house for a while and then i'm going to give you a tour of the dungeon you, you can stay in the cell that I was in. We've made it available for you. I've been waiting for this moment. He had the power. He could have gotten his revenge. But instead of looking at his circumstances through human eyes, he said, I knew that you meant evil against me, but listen, it's okay because God even meant that for good. And he brought it about in my life. He said, how could a man that was abandoned by his brothers and sold into slavery and imprisoned Look back on his life and say, well, God meant it for good because he believed and he had faith in God. He lived with God in faith so that he didn't judge his life based upon what he saw. If he had judged his life based upon what he saw, he would have said, well, I'm a man that's hated by his own family. I'm a man that's falsely accused. I'm a man that's never had a chance in life. I'm a man that's never had a fair deal. I'm a man that suffered in justice, in prison, he could have said, I'm just a victim of circumstance, but that's not what Joseph said. Joseph said, even though you meant evil against me, God meant good for me. And he believed and he trusted in God. And I want you to understand that God is good and God loves you. And right now you may be suffering all kinds of things, whether it's health or relationship, or financial problems, don't look at your circumstances and base your faith in God upon what you see. Base your faith in God about, upon what He has revealed in His Word. And He has revealed in His Word that He is good, that He loves us, and that He has a long-range plan for our lives. So that even when I can't see it and I don't understand it, if I trust God, He's working on my behalf, and God is with me. God, He delivered Joseph, and He took care of him. I want you to notice something else. The Bible says that God gave Joseph what he needed. Look at verse 10. The Bible says in verse 10, and rescued him out of all his afflictions, and listen to this, and gave him favor... And wisdom 
before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Do you know why Joseph was wise? It's because God gave him wisdom. Joseph had favor before Pharaoh because God gave him favor. The Bible says, if any of us lacks wisdom, let us ask God, who gives freely to all who ask. And friend, I want you to understand, you may feel inadequate to do what God's called you to do. And in your own power, you are inadequate. But God is not calling us to do anything in our own power. He's calling us to trust in Him. And when we trust in Him, He gives us what we need. You know, I've discovered throughout my ministry, uh, some of my best sermons were the ones that I started preparing in stark terror. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but uh, if you were given the opportunity to preach, I believe most Christians that grew up in church could preach a real good sermon. The problem comes when just a few hours later you have to preach another one, and then the next Sunday another one, and then Wednesday night. You know, church people can be really unreasonable. If you're the pastor, they want you to preach every time you have a service, and uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about what it takes to come up with something fresh, helpful, and accurate to say every service. And I remember there were times early in my ministry preaching through the Bible. I'd, I'd committed, you know, I'm going to preach your Bible, Lord. I'm going to preach your Word. And I'd start at one place, and I'd get, you know, a few passages ahead, and I'd come to a passage, and I'd read it, and I would think, how in the world am I going to preach this passage? I'm not even sure I understand it. And I'd, I'd be on my knees in prayer and study in preparation all week and yet come to church on Sunday and see God move in a miraculous way. Because if you trust God, He will give you what you need. And God gave Joseph wisdom and God gave Joseph favor before Pharaoh. And you see, when God is with you, He empowers you. There's no substitute for having God's hand upon you. There's simply not. I've been uh, blessed to see some amazing things so far in my first 20-something years of ministry. I really have. I've seen some amazing, extraordinary things. But I'm not naive or foolish enough to think that I accomplished them on my own. God's hand was upon me. And I experienced his favor at many times. And I believe if we are to trust in God and depend upon him, we can see his hand upon this church. And we can experience and see things that none of us are capable of doing on our own. Friend, you can live your life against God. Or you can live with God. In faith in Him. The choice is yours. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for men like Joseph and Stephen that believed, even in the face of death, that you were good and that you were faithful. And Father, I pray that today there might be some men and women in this congregation. Lord, that have that same kind of faith. Father, I pray that we would be totally and utterly dependent upon you. And Lord, just as you provided for these men, I pray that you'd provide everything that we need to serve you faithfully. God, please use this church to change our community to give hope to people that have none. To give life to people that are headed toward eternal death. And Father, may you receive all the credit for everything that's accomplished. For it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. You know, you can face life's problems on your own. Uh, but I, I don't want to. 
And I hope you don't either. You see, the Bible says that God has demonstrated His love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Because, friend, God is for us. And if you believe and trust in Him, you can be forgiven of your sin. And you can be saved from ever having to face the consequences of your sin. Friend, if there's never been a time in your life that you've done this, I would urge you today as we sing this song, would you just call out to the Lord in prayer? Say, I don't, I don't really know what to pray, but I'd like to. That's why I'm here at the end of the service. I can help you pray. But the Bible says if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And God's promises are true. You know, I expect that on Sunday morning here at First Baptist, that most of us have probably already done this. But God is not finished working in you yet. You know how I know that? Because you're still here. You're still here. You might be retired from your job and career, but you don't retire from God's kingdom. And He's got something for you to do. And if you'll believe Him and trust in Him, He'll go with you and He'll empower you and He'll give you everything that you need. All we have to do is be willing to come to the point in our life that we say, Hear my Lord, send me. So I'd ask you today, if you're a believer, are you truly living with God in faith? And I mean believing and trusting in Him every day to lead you, to guide you, direct you. Friend, if you're not, why don't you trust in Him today? Repentance is not a one-time thing that takes place when we get saved. We have to constantly repent of things throughout our life as God works to conform us closer to His Son. And maybe you're at a time in your life that right now things are going really easy. It's easy to have faith when things are going well. But if we truly believe with all of our heart, we'll have faith that will see us through even the darkest moments of life. And so I want to encourage you today to trust God in every area. Trust Him with your career. Trust Him with your finances. Trust Him with your family. Trust Him with your marriage. Trust in Him. He will never let you down. 